Welcome to Low Tech Tuesdays by Low Tech and Wild, the podcast for people who live their lives unplugged and for those who want to. So you're the Valdez uh, Ice Climbing Festival chair for 2022. Um, can you... Tell me a little bit about how long you've been involved with the Valdez Ice Climbing Festival. I've been involved with the Valdez Ice Climbing Festival for the last five years, I do believe. Yeah, five years. So I was first invited up, I think it was, what about like 2017, possibly? Yeah, 2017, and uh, just kind of got started with it to help more. I was up there to help develop some of the, the youth ice climbing programs that started, helped them develop the the youth ice climbing program they have for the festival, and that's kind of what my main focus was. And then we shot some photos as well. I was hired as a photographer as well, so I kind of did both parts <laughs> there. And then uh, over time, just kind of grew into doing more, and then getting more involved with the city of Valdez, working with uh, their rock climbing program at their rock ball they have there, and just kind of been keep getting pulled back into Valdez. <laughs> so this had made a commitment to move there. So I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to commit to that committee. Sure. So. Um, so, cause, so youth, uh, you, let's focus on that for a second. You, um, you had a gym for a while and you were a youth instructor, a mentor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had a rock climbing gym for the last 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess 2013 is when I started. So almost, almost, almost 10 years. Ten years. <laughs> yeah. So, and then, uh, it's gone, uh, I started, a, a youth ice climbing, a youth uh, rock climbing program. So. We kind of traveled to competitive, and then I started other like after school programs for GM and our city of Toronto. And then I developed the USA Youth Ice Climbing Program to help um, young kids get involved in ice climbing and the competitive side of it. And then some of those kids now have gone on and succeeded in the sport. So. Wonderful, yeah. Um, how did you find time to maintain your own? athleticism while you were teaching and running a rock climbing gym yeah that is the hard fact of life it's like balancing well one family time balancing work and then also balancing my own personal health and well-being yeah um, definitely have struggled to let some of those things down that let my part down in my own uh, put other people first before me and now i've kind of refocused on how do i maintain what I do and also maintain my own health and balance and unfortunately you have to get up kind of early sometimes and so I get up early mm-hmm. and then like today I got up early at uh, five and then when I just did a 12 mile run this morning wow um yeah I did that <laughs> so that was my morning routine and I come home and I do I do a lot of journaling and reflection kind of stuff so I did that and it kind of like helps me like um be grounded with myself and then for I can actually be good with other things I have to do for the day and for the week and that kind of stuff. So it's yeah. become more my normal routine. Yeah. Yeah. Um do you mind me asking you about your age? Oh my age, yeah. <laughs> I am uh, forty six. Okay. Like forty six. And <laughs> What is so? What do you think keeps you going? I mean, what what is, you must have some sort of a nutritional regime or something. Do you have? A, you know, has it changed throughout the years? Oh man, the, this year has really changed. Before, I, I think I was very well. I I was I know I was very fortunate as a as a person, like a genetic wise, athleticism was pretty easy for me. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that came from because my parents were quite like that. <laughs> so it was more of a self um, passion inside of myself that kind of burns inside of me, this internal flame that wants to do good for my body. And um, But I also know I took advantage of my athletic abilities and my nutrition. I could pretty much eat anything and keep going, but now. Once I hit 45 and over, I'm like, hmm, I got to start over. So this year, I actually had a nutrition coach uh, kind of help with me and uh, figure out some things. And I figured that pretty good. I'm, I was pretty well connected with my body. and knew if it was missing something or lacking something. And I do a lot of self-education. So I'm, I'm kind of a geek with that. I like 
the tech side of, and the uh, nutrition side and the science side of just athleticism and how our body functions for, you know, nutrition with sports specific training with this, you know, PT type stuff. So I think that's what's helped me keep going with my body because a lot of people, like this year, I just, I just ran a 40 mile race last week. Okay. Yeah, last week. And, um, what was the this? I've actually ever ran with an time. incline, right? What's that? With an incline? Oh, yeah, I had over 10,000 feet of vert. <laughs> yeah. So it's not vert. just any 40 mile. We have to preface this <laughs> with you're in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, most of it was all at like 11 and 12,000 feet for running. Wow. Um, yeah, it's called the Grand Traverse. It was a, and it's something I aspired to do years ago. And I was a pretty big runner like 20 something years ago and then kind of fell out of it and kind of fell out of love with the mountains just because of going through with a lot of friends that died in the mountains. I just kind of like stepped away from that. And then that whole thing of balancing my own well being and family life, I really had to become more the father role for a while. And now my daughter's off in college and now I'm kind of refocusing on what I really enjoy. And, um, a friend of mine had introduced me to uh, climbing like three years ago as I was helping her train. For her, uh, 50K, I'm like, oh, I kind of like running again. <laughs> so I just got back into running, but just took my time and like knew my body wasn't able to do the things that used to do. So I just focused on the strength and conditioning and not so much long runs all the time, but now I feel pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah. So now I'm just increasing what my body is capable of, both the climbing, you know, trying to balance my climbing too. I, I definitely work out for climbing and I work out for running as well. So it's pretty, pretty complex sometimes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's a lot. That's a lot. It's hard to have uh, two very high intensity ha uh, hobbies like that or, yeah. you know, sports that you love. Um, do they balance each other out in any sort of way? Yeah, I think they definitely balance them out. Like I, lately I've been focusing on how to actually breathe. Like I okay. always breathe with the climbing, but with the running side, it's like I felt off with my breathing. So I really focus on actually nose breathing. So running like a mile or two, just my nose only. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me actually, it's crazy how you can control your heart rate with just your nose breathing. Mm -hmm. So, and kind of had that, but like with climbing, it's actually, I always taught like how to breathe and how to calm your heart rate while you're rock climbing especially leaf climbing and that kind of stuff, how to control your emotions with your heart rate yeah. and anxiety that kind of spikes up sometimes. But I never really, now the two have come come together. So I'm learning how to breathe in both aspects, um, like especially climbing up a big steep hill or then learning how to be calm and relaxed on a steep, or I mean a technical climb or something like that. So it's kind of interesting how they deep balance themselves out. Right. Do you meditate also? I just got, I kind of dabbled in it, but this year I kind of more kind of got into it. So like it's part of my morning routine. It doesn't, it's not like a full, I'm too ADHD, I think so. Yeah. Okay. But it's like, it, it's, I'm actually learning more. So I've been taking my time doing like three minutes here, or six minutes here, and okay. like maybe 10 minutes is like the max of my brain. Yeah. To stay focused on how I'm breathing and how I'm connecting and the sounds and you know, I'm learning how to really block out other sounds and be a little bit more focused inside internally with the gotcha. breathing and just being there with me. Yeah. Well, the breathing, uh, exercise or the, the, your practice of breathing while you're doing your activities made me, uh, wonder about whether or not you did, um, still meditation also. But I think that there's been a lot of scientific research that has come out about the benefits of breath work and the variety of different kinds of breath work that um yeah. that exists in the world yogis have been yes. doing pranayama for millennia right so right yeah so i was when i got into i don't know how i still went on about the nose breathing but then i got like geeked out I'm like oh i want to understand what the phenomenon is with this so i found this youtube video of a professor talking about nose breathing and it was interesting that you know, three or 4,000 years ago, we were not uh, mouth breathers as right. we are today. Right, right. So our, our evolution, our jaws have changed to accommodate how we breathe with our mouths. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting. So 
that kind of got me intrigued, like, why those breathing? Because they don't only focus on those breathing, you actually focus on where it's coming in from the stomach, you know, if it's coming from low down and right. low or near your chest. And then that's a lot of stuff. And I've been working with a massage therapist who's helped me, is actually massaging my back and my ass and that kind of stuff to help open up my rib cage. Mm-hmm. And during the last race, I felt felt really good. Like you know, my body was really exhausted at the end, but I know my heart rate stayed at 120, 130. Oh, wow. Most of the time. Um, that's pretty amazing. I was keeping at like 11 to 12 minute pace. The oh, my gosh. Miles. And then I just got like, my, my, this has some issues like with my hamstrings. So it slowed down drastically. And then the last part of the race was super steep. And I just destroyed my legs all together. <laughs> and the last five miles are the hardest part of the whole race. Wow. <laughs> so and most mentally and physically, it's just like a taxing on me. And actually had, I had cell service instantly. And I reached out to a friend like, I don't know if I can finish. I'm struggling. Mm-hmm. And she just gave me support. I said, you got this. And I, you know, so it was good. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's amazing what the, what the human body can endure. Isn't it? it? Yeah. It's also amazing. Like how important, like just support, like a simple support. Yeah. Word sometimes, you know, like, Oh yeah. So, cause I, I listen to a lot of motivational talks when I'm running. Okay. So, <laughs> so in a way the running is actually my meditation. Yes. That's a long, 10 hours of running is a long meditation. <laughs> That's a long time to run. <laughs> but a much less a long time to meditate. Yeah. Wow. Um, and you are a peak runner. Is that correct? So it's a specific type yeah. of running? Yeah, I like to run in and do technical training, technical peak. So that's okay. how combining my rock climbing and your trail running kind of comes together and they kind of marry each other. So I like to, to run in and then climb, you know, 5'5", five, five, up to 5'8", stuff, and then run off and run back home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Is, is there any sort of specific gear that goes along with uh, with being a peak runner? Yeah, I think. Trail the shoes. Gear is like um, or your rugby gear. So like shoes, like what type of shoes you're going to be using. Mm-hmm. You know, if I know it's going to be a technical train, I'm looking for a shoe that can both run and can climb with me, so I don't have to bring an extra pair of climbing shoes. Yeah. Uh, but then sometimes, like if I'm running in um, a flat irons, which is in Boulder, they're mm-hmm. actually more technical clients. So I run in, but I do bring my rock shoes, but that hard stuff. That's I say five five and up. Okay. I see. Bring my, you know, just so I know I have a, a higher level of success. Mm-hmm. So then I have to accommodate, like, okay, what kind of path am I going to run? Running. So I'm not going to take a regular small day pack, or am I going to take actually like a runner's vest? Right. And typically, I'll take a runner's vest just because it compacts everything down and can move with you and put freedom. Gotcha. And then there's hydration. So like, do I go with a bladder? Do I go with a, just a little flask? You know, what am I going to be doing for that? And then, and then lately, like so some of the longer runs in the peaks, it's like, okay, how am I going to treat water? Like, I can't carry all the water I need. Mm-hmm. It's getting crazy. So learning how to, you know, treat water fast in the streams. So then before you got to think about a pump, non-pump, um, I take, um, I take, these chlorine pills or these tablets things and sometimes I take liquid chlorine and treat my water that way as well it's pretty clean because I'm up in the mountains so I know pretty much where the water source is coming from yeah it's just to uh I've had an issue once with uh Georgia. oh no <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 was terrifying but yeah I used to do a lot of like adventure racing so I would do like 100 to 400 mile, 500 mile races. So I learned, wow. learned a lot about like how to treat water fast. And, you know, and, um, so that was, that kind of looked back on that knowledge, but now technology and the technical aspect has changed quite a bit. So there's a lot more easier stuff to use these days. Gotcha. That's good. That's good. Uh, good information for sure. Yeah. I think I saw an interview with you where you were talking about um some of the complications that occur when you're out there either on a rock face or running yeah. those sorts of you know <laughs> in the back country sort of thing i mean you have to do what you have to do sometimes right yeah 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 i mean i've trained straight out of the streams you know kind of like okay what's my 
well, I gotta finish this race so I can do our the other issues a week or two weeks from now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's something that happens, but you definitely look at you can drink water out in the, in the backcountry just if you know where it's coming from and, and then how to look for what's going on in the streams working and you know kind of using nature's you know cleansing your abilities sure so has covid and the pandemic affected um any of the events that you've been uh participating on uh your home life your you know workout regime yeah i think definitely um well, home life and then a lot of the clinics, uh, just that recently, I was supposed to be leaving for clinic next Tuesday into West Virginia, but um, they just recently shut it down mm -hmm. um, as of last Friday. And then other clinics are like up on the air that I, you know, travel and teach a lot of climbing clinics. Mm -hmm. You know, so COVID has definitely impacted um, the stability of what that's actually part of my work life. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's affected my work life as far as like, Interesting, I also do like construction work, and that's actually seemingly increased, which is ironic. Hmm, interesting. Uh, more people are doing more work. Maybe they're realizing they have a lot of stuff they have to take care of yeah. at home. Um, and then the workout stuff is more, I definitely have gotten more in the backcountry and outside more um, than I used to, like on the trails and that kind of stuff. But the thing that has affected that as well, it's interesting that more people are outside nowadays, which is awesome. But it's becoming more crowded in it, and it's tr trails I used to run. Interesting. I don't really see that many people nowadays. It's like I actually have to get there earlier, right? So I don't see people. Not that I don't want to see people, but I kind of like being alone. <laughs> it's it's peaceful. Running, it's kind of for me. Yeah. yeah it's, just, it's more I run for myself. So yeah. How do you think that? Running. Yeah. Um. Uh, not to interrupt, but uh, so how do you think that this influx of people that are coming in to um, to experience outdoor recreation uh, is impacting the Leave No Trace and the National Outdoor Leadership Schools programs and, you know, things like that, like, um, you know, pack in, pack out. I mean, do you think that they're looking at this as like a trend, you know, that's going to go away and then they're going to go back to their cities or their suburbs? Or do you think that this is a real change? Yeah, to be honest, I definitely, I ran into a, a ranger um, on one of the trails I run and I told her, to be honest, in like 25 years I've been on this trail, I've never seen a ranger. And I thought we had that kind of discussion. It's like, you know, what's, what do you think she goes in? They honestly see like the numbers as this being a new norm because people are recognizing like actually what we actually have. You know, it's it's pretty interesting here. I live in Jerry Colorado and but three no four years ago I had to do a presentation to the uh Durango Tourism. Mm -hmm. Um and they I shot some pictures of all the stuff that we have around us. Um and some of the people who live here didn't even know about some of the hikes that we have, they're like literally five minutes from downtown. It was pretty interesting, but nowadays now everybody knows about them. You know, that kind of stuff, especially with the, the social media and that kind of stuff, people, you know, tagging areas. And yeah. That's where that's kind of the new, this is the new norm. And, you know, definitely in the outdoor industry here, it's been, it's been, there's a lot, there's a low and a lot of supplies and equipment. It's yeah. pretty interesting. Things are going like crazy because people are recognizing, like, oh, I got to get size. I need this jacket. I need these tracking poles. I need these shoes. I need this climbing gear. Yeah. You know, especially in the climbing industry, is, um, you know, a couple of my climbing the sponsors I have, they like, yeah, we're low on stuff. We can't keep stuff in stock anymore. So it's pretty interesting. And therefore, they're kind of like wondering, like, do we really need to do these clinics? Is it because the idea with the clinics is to help promote products that we use? Right. You know, get the products in um, our clients' hands so they're sure. forced to sell. Gotcha. Um, but nowadays, people are just like getting whatever they can get. <laughs> kind of yeah. Thing, so. Yeah. I wonder also about um, with so many new people that are experiencing outdoor recreation. How it's going to impact injury and um, and even fatalities for some of these for some of these sports? Uh, maybe people uh, not knowing the history of some of the different of the, some of the different sports like alpinism, mountaineering, and such. Um, maybe not really knowing um, you know the uh, any techniques or 
you know, not really having a background in it. I wonder, um, you know, if there's going to be more new people that are going to, mm-hmm. you know, sort of make rookie mis- mistakes and, and things like that. So how do you think that safety and, and instruction actually, you know, so it gives a new spin on some of these clinics, you know, a new purpose maybe for some of these clinics that you've been teaching in the past. It maybe were demo for gear um, was one purpose for, for them, but now it could be a whole nother issue and, and brands could even jump on board with the concepts of, of, uh, of teaching, leave no trace and also safety yeah. skills, you know? Yeah. I think, um, so the trend is people are getting out there, yeah, not being educated, you know, instructional wise. Um, and a lot of that is too, the jam and the crag kind of scenario. Um, there's been a lot of definitely the accidents and the activity um, a couple weeks ago too, because just people thinking the grades kind of correlate with like how they climb inside right. and stuff. And therefore they can even watch a YouTube video or something about how to build anchors and that kind of stuff. And um, there was an accident recently in LR Canyon where complete gear, uh, anchor failure, which should mm-hmm. never happen. Sure. So it's going to easier or train or both, Climbers fell from the face. One died. One you know, sustained injuries. But it's a simple like just teaching, taking a basic anchor class and understanding the mechanics of how an anchor is, is properly put together. And right. It's kind of what I'm doing this year. I'm teaching uh, four different anchor clinics all over the U.S. Yeah. Um, so I'm teaching one next week in Oregon. Um, then teaching one in Moab. Teaching one in Bishop. Wonderful. Uh, teach one in West Virginia. And I'll be teaching, you know, stuff um, for ice climbing too. So translating the anchor scenario into the ice climbing world, and there's a lot, a lot of information out there now. Like anchors and climbing anchors have been around for ages, and mm-hmm. now people are trying to figure out more simplified ways and that kind of stuff. But it all goes back to like if we just go back to our basics of what an anchor is, you know, and that kind of stuff, and understanding and like you know, it's got to be strong. It's got to have no extensions. And, you know, it's got to be redundant and yes. kind of stuff and understanding where, where, what's the higher level of priority, you know, where there's no shop building and is it redundant? Right. And then go to building onto that. And then you can get into simple anchors, complex anchors, and understanding the mechanics and then understanding how the rope is in play, is played into the anchor systems. So there's a lot of knowledge out there. We be breaking down to the basic knowledge. You can take that skill set to other elements of climbing and that kind of stuff so yeah that's kind of my focus this year is to bring that to attention to people you know like this the simple aspect of what a basic anchor is absolutely you know, i think that's the most important thing and people overthink sometimes and, and don't think enough you know so it's pretty interesting so i want to educate as a climbing mentor and as a professional athlete to educate people into the basic knowledge of anchors awesome and speaking of um being a professional athlete, when was the first time that you got a sponsor? And what what was who was your first who was your first sponsor? What was that like? Were you thrilled? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that I must have been really I exciting. Two, I think I was twenty, maybe twenty years old. And I started climbing when I was thirteen. And you're from Dallas. And you're from Dallas. Dallas, Texas. So yeah, Texas. Where it's Fort just Worth. yeah. <laughs> So I got into, it's interesting, I got into uh, competitive rock climbing. So that's how I kind of got into it. So I started climbing outside. Okay. And then the gyms kind of appeared in in Dallas. So I did some climbing competition. Nice. And I remember doing my first climbing competition. And, and, you know, I've been climbing a couple years, but I didn't know where I sat. So I entered into men's advance. You know, there was no, like, you, there's all, do this group then. Mm-hmm. So I climbed and I, I splashed all of my routes. So therefore, they put me into the elite category. So then I had to climb. I remember there was isolation. I never knew what isolation was. And, you know, then here I am in isolation. I just did all my routes, but now I'm competing in the pro division. And um, I'm sitting there with all these athletes I like read in mag- read about in magazines. Wow! So that was like it was like Hans Florin, it's Christian Griffin, and all these names I read in articles and seen pictures of. And I'm like getting like oh, I'm like a 16 year old kid, you know, <laughs> the youngest kid in there, you know, I'm trying to listen to my uh, disc man <laughs> CD player, 
the next patient I had no idea what to do with they just came over and like you know they could tell I was like nervous and they just like gave these incredible words of encouragement like you know just go out there and have fun that's what it's about and that's all we're here about we don't care how we compete against each other you know there's like money involved <laughs> you know but it was just so it was it's really fun and uh and then after that Christian Griffin had Verve find me and that was kind of like my first kind of like sponsorship with Verve and okay. he sent me a bunch of shorts and clothing and then then I got a couple of other ones over the years, and then my biggest one was um, there used to be a company called uh, uh, what am I thinking of? I can't think of the name of it right now, but uh, it'll come to me later. But a rope climbing company out of Canada, okay. And that was the first time I really got involved in how ropes are manufactured. It's three ropes, that's how they work. It's three ropes. Um, that's how they, I mean, I learned a lot because I actually went up to the factory and I understand and saw how ropes were made and performed. and Oh wow! Know, like test, testing with it and that kind of stuff, and that was my role as an athlete was just to really use the gear and test it, and uh, that was pretty. It was pretty awesome because it was an on hands, you know, small company, but they they uh, you know supported my passion. Yeah. So and I stayed with them for a while until they couldn't, you know, they no longer were able to grow because they treaty because they were out of Canada, and the U.S. There's a lot of treaty issues with the the filaments of the ropes and that kind of stuff. So kind of dropped off. But then over time, I got picked up by other sponsors and stuff like that. And kind of was out of it for a while when I was being like the father and just did more construction life. But and then, then I kind of slowly got back into it. And uh, now I've been, yeah, pro athlete again. So, yeah. That's kind fantastic. Of been a coaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, may I ask, how do you feel about, um, like, are you seeing that there is such a thing as, uh, as ageism in outdoor, uh, recreation mm -hmm. sports? And then also I'm, I'm wondering if you are seeing, um, maybe more people that are, uh, able to get involved because perhaps when you get older, then you have more, um, uh, uh you know, you maybe more savings or maybe more time like you've worked. And so now you have that, uh, you know, expendable cash to buy the climbing gear that you've never, you know, wanted to. I think that, you know, brands would want to represent some of the people that might be able to actually spend the money on a new uh, gear. You know? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think there is becoming issues with the age and a lot of that I think is more the social media aspect of like how many followers they have, how are they representing, who is following them? Yeah. The age category. Mm -hmm. You know, is it millenniums? Is it, you know, different it's interesting different age categories. And you know, recently I was kind of involved in what I felt like was ageism from okay. a sponsor and was let go and because they were wanting to build a younger team yeah. aspect of it. Yeah, then I was picked up by another sponsor who loves what I do, and you know, and it's just not, it's not a, uh, it's not a determining factor. It's like how you perform, how you show up. Okay. I think is the key thing, you know, and it's pretty interesting, just the philosophies behind them. So it's all about how their marketing program or their marketing plan yeah. kind of plays a role with that. And, you know, I think there are other bigger sponsors too that, don't really consider the age. It's all about how they're performing as a team member. Okay. You know, they see the person as a team member. And I think that's the most important aspect that um, is awesome. What is that like? What is that like to be um, a sponsored athlete and, and to be a team member? Do you have certain responsibilities? Do you work together that's as good. a team? All of yeah, we working together mm -hmm. with other athletes that uh, maybe um, – you know, going out and putting up first assists, you know, and before first assists were more for a personal thing for a lot of times, but for me and it's not like a team membership is part of my sponsor stuff, but like putting up new routes is so others can continue to grow the sport. So that's kind of like some of my role as a, as a professional athlete. And then also me teaching climbing, traveling, teaching clinics is kind of what I, what I personally have been, um, utilize the most for my sponsors is that I'm one of the most um you know people sought after clinic instructor 
because I'm not only a pro athlete, but I'm also really good at teaching and communicating how yeah. to teach climbing. And so it's pretty interesting. Um, lately, all, one of my sponsors, Sterling, we have a younger uh, female that is new to sponsor athlete, and mm-hmm. she's like 16, 17. But I just had this amazing meeting with her. Like she was like in awe that I was taking the time to teach her how to teach climbing. You know, here she is as a, as a she's now a pro athlete. You know, yeah. I'm 16, but she really like looked up to me. And sure. she's like, you're a, you're a legend. Like, I'm not a legend. I'm just a person. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but she's like, you know, I, she's so, she was so nervous that she had to teach this intro to sport climbing. And sure. I said, you know, that's my role is to help her to pursue and keep growing this sport. So yeah. that I'm helping to build younger climbers to teach this sport of climbing. Sure. And, you know, not only so much. It was interesting. Like, it's intro to sport climbing. It's, you know, it should be an easy class, but you actually have to teach about the emotional side of leading, you know, learning how to lead. Um, yeah. you know, there's a huge um, disconnect with the emotional side that people who don't know how to teach climbing don't recognize how to read people. So you have to understand that each person is a unique individual and you have to approach how to teach them with their abilities, not with your abilities. So that's the key thing. Right. Yeah. So certainly a 16 or 17 year old pro athlete hasn't gone through any of the mountaineering or guiding schools that, that are out there yet. Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah. they are just good at what they do. So they haven't gotten to any of like the pedagogy of yeah. or how, you know, how to relate to students and to be the leader. I, I think that's, you know, even speaking in public could be difficult because when you're on a rock or you're doing what you're, you're good at doing, you, you're yeah. in your own head mm-hmm. and then you have to figure out how you're going to get that information out of your head and yeah. relate it, you know, so that everybody, you know, is safe and they're educated and they can, they can uh, have fun in the sport and have that freedom really to have fun um, in the sport. Um, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Um, I had uh, last year, I was hired by a guide service itself to help his guys how to teach climbing. You know, here are these guys, yes. are, you know, AMG guys, but there's a difference between being a climbing guide and being a climbing instructor. Absolutely. Like how to actually teach climbing. So it was really cool. They took a three-day seminar with me. Yeah. And I went through all the drills I work on and taught them how I teach these drills and how to approach people and how to see mechanics of how the climber is and how to translate what you need to teach particularly and explain it in ways that been drilled so people can understand. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. I think that, you know, um, I think that's what it's, that's what it's all about really. And so it's, you're a mentor on, on multiple levels. You're a mentor to people who are getting into the sport and you're a mentor to people who are, have been in it, but then, you know, really they're, they need to be able to be mentors themselves. You know, and, and I think that as uh, rock climbing and ice climbing grow, that's going to become more and more important because somebody has to um, teach the next generation of climbers or outdoors people or um, mountaineers about kind of like what's been an unwritten code of ethics uh, for, you know, etiquette and, and climbing and um, you know, trash, like we were saying, leave no, leave no trace, you know, dog etiquette at the crag, you know, all of these things. Um, if it's snowing, what's underneath the snow, you know, I mean, how much, how much impact are we really creating by doing what we're doing? And so, um, yeah, I, I think that this is one of those kind of arts in a way that is, uh, so vast, but they're, you know, we're really teaching each other. It's like word of mouth, you know, it's kind of like we're, we're relaying this word of mouth person to person. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. I mean, did you mention that? Cause last night I got a text from a person who works for RAB. She's a sales associate at the RAB, one of my sponsors. Mm-hmm. And she just, she reached out to me and it's like, Hey, I have an interesting question. She's working at a rock climbing wall, kind of an older climbing wall and that kind of stuff. And 
the guys are really set on is everybody only using ATCs, or now the kind of norm is using assisted breaking devices. Mm. So, and she felt they were going backwards. Right. You know, and she, and she, she spoke up, but they said, no, this is what we're doing. You know, which Liability. doesn't feel right. Yeah. You know, and so she just reached out and just wanted my professional opinion. And I said, no, assisted, and, you know, I've been a gym owner myself. Yeah. But yeah, assisted breaking devices, you know, they, they do save lives. I've they seen do. the effects of how they've saved lives. And, you know, so I sent her a bunch of links and in my own personal experiences. And, you know, once here, we had a climbing accident here in Turingo where the assisted breaking device saved both climbers because the leader had fallen when a rock got dislodged and knocked her out. Right. And then the, the belayer got yanked up and that same rock hit her and knocked her out. Oh my her goodness. Hands off the blade device, but the only thing that saved them was the assisted brake device. Yeah. So there were two climbers suspended in the air, only being held by the assisted brake device. Absolutely, yeah. It's like worst case scenario, but the outcome was great, you know. Redundancy, like you were saying. Redundancy. Redundancy. We're always in a back, climbing is about backup systems. Right. And the only thing that used to not be backed up was the... Uh, per the yeah. Uh, yeah. You could you could put a, like, um, I don't think that a lot of people go through the trouble of making their own with paracord. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, when the uh, braking assist device was created, it was really, you know... Um, it was quite a breakthrough. And I, I think a lot of, and I think also that, uh, with insurance, when you are a gym owner, there are a lot of climbers also that have a very difficult time getting in, getting any kind of insurance because it's, it is a risky sport. And I think that, yeah. you know, when you're used to climbing in a gym, when maybe the biggest wall you climb is like 20 or 30 or 40 feet, you know, and yeah. there are multiple holds on there. So if you get off your 5'11", you can just jump on that 5'5", five five, you know? Yeah. So, um, but it's not like that and it, when you're really out, outside and you're doing it, yeah. um, you know, in nature, it's it's a lot more unpredictable. Yeah, I mean, I think that brings up to, like, why the Jim to Craig clinics have yes. really, they were pretty big and then they should have kind of faded out, but I think it could be brought back up because now there is this transition and it has to be more simplified actually how to translate your GM experience to the outside. And when you go outside, it is bringing in the leave no trace and, you know, um, yes. and honey etiquette. Yes. You know, like, do you leave the radio at the home? Do you right. speaker at home? That's kind of like been an interesting thing. Um, especially here in Drain Harbor, like I was out climbing and literally could hear this radio blasting. And I was like, there was no one around me, but like around the corner, there was a group of people climbing and this guy had climbed and set up all these ropes for his friends. Mm -hmm. So it's like he made his own gym outside, but he had took up like five different routes. Wow. And there were only like four of them climbing. Mm -hmm. And I was like that. And I, and so it was all top rope. You want to say anything? Yeah. I'm like, no, I got to say something. Like, hey, this isn't, I just let you know this isn't cool. This isn't the way of climbing outside is about. And he sure. took it actually, he like, oh, that makes sense. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. But before I've had other issues where I've had to say something or I saw something very dangerous and like, you need to stop. And then they were like, yeah. Yeah, we know what we're doing. I'm like, no, you don't know what you're doing. You need to stop right now because you're prevent, you're going to, cause an accident and I'm going to be involved in your rescue. Right, right, I'm right. stopping here right now. Yeah. So. Yeah, people that, you know, maybe they're not familiar with cleaning their ropes, they step on their ropes, you know, mm -hmm. um, loose dogs, all kinds of things, you know, walking underneath the rope uh, when somebody's mm -hmm. lead climbing or something like that. I mean, there are all kinds of little things. Um, falling yeah. rocks, people that aren't wearing helmets. You know, yeah, no, it is, it's, it's tricky and it's easy to get complacent because, you know, maybe you go to that same spot, you know, week after week after week. And it's really just like maybe a five, eight or something like that. And you and your friends go out there and they, you're just having fun. You're just, you know, spending a day outside. And then all of a sudden, maybe because of rain or because of a storm, a tree branch falls, you're, you know, a, a rock that was wedged in there, um, is loose. You know, yeah. I mean, 
there are all kinds of things that, that are just unpredictable. Something that maybe you use as an anchor isn't there anymore. So I was very encouraged with uh, the revival of trad climbing, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of slowly coming back, which is pretty interesting. That's, that's when I grew up was climbing track first, and then I yeah. got introduced to Austin. Yeah. Climbing. Yeah. I was like, I climbed the e rock and I climbed it, the Wichita, and it was mostly all track. And that's what I knew. And then yeah. someone took me to your Robbers Range. This right. was like in 90. It's bolded. 92? 93? <laughs> oh, it was like bolts. Yeah. Oh, this is nice. We had no idea what we're getting on. Like, oh, it's, you know, this. Like, oh, yeah, it's got harder than the other one. That's how we used to rate the grass. Like, that felt no harder. Right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, ratings are so subjective. I mean, like you were saying, somebody that climbs like a five, you know, they're just sending you know, 5'11", 5'12", in the gym, and they go out, and it's like 5'11", 5'12", in nature, and they're like, this isn't, this isn't a 5'11", you know? So, yeah, yeah, much so. harder. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to kind of play on to, like, the uh, whole, the mentoring, too. I had uh, recently, I was kind of been following this friend of mine, and she just went out to climb in New River Gorge, Okay. And she had posted that she struggled on her first day. She didn't send this route. And I just reached out to her, like, I don't know, and just asked you a couple of questions. Just a way of, like, how social media is, like, kind of, like, mentoring. But, like, well, how was your approach? Why did you think you fell? You know, all these different things. And I told her, like, okay, Nick, tomorrow, why don't you focus on these things? And then she actually sent her first 512 outside. Oh, fantastic. It was pretty interesting. You know, I just coached her from afar. Yeah. <laughs> it's know? like you were saying. So it's interesting. It's just that little bit sometimes. Those little, little bit. Yeah, those yeah. little words of encouragement. <laughs> That's pretty great, yeah. And and not giving up. So, you know, yeah. it, it can feel like uh, like time to give up sometimes. And, you know, and then you get those little words of encouragement. And then before yeah. you know it. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so what do you think? Uh, what are you thinking about this year's, um, or 2022's, uh, Valley's Ice Climbing Festival? Do you have any particular plans or some things that you'd like to see happen? I think this year, for the 2022, um, Valley's Ice Festival was really just bringing more of the community-based aspect of the clinics. That's kind of, for me, what draws me to teach these clinics is how we connect as a community I like not only during the festival, like during the clinic spa, so at nighttime, you know, kind of connecting as far as, especially too, as a, as a professional athlete, is I like to be connected with the people in the community that I'm there for, you know, like, Wonderful. You, know, you know, like what the Alaskan community is about and that kind of stuff. And it's pretty, pretty interesting community. It is. <laughs> so, yeah, and then the Valdez community, you know, in this town tucked out in the middle of nowhere, you know, that's some amazing um, people, <laughs> you know. Really? Some interesting people. So it's really cool to connect with them and see what they have, you know. Like, these guys have this amazing place in their backyard. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, and for us to share that to other people. Um, and also, it really develops a new, maybe some new clinics or improvise or even grow some of the stuff that the clinics that we've been teaching and trying to reach out to more demographics and you know, yeah. so, um, there's a lot of different things going on with our society now with the, you know the, um, the labeling of people or gender specific it's interesting. roles and all that kind yeah. of stuff it's pretty interesting you know and I was first kind of introduced to that like two three years ago now at Bozeman Ice Festival I was asked to teach a um uh, people of color class, uh -huh. which was pretty interesting. And it's like, oh, oh, I didn't. For me personally, I don't see people as color. I see people as people. Sure. But it was pretty interesting. Like here they are wanting me to teach this class, but then the guy who was putting on the clinic had reached out to me. And he was like, you know, what what ethic are you? Like he didn't even know what I was. So I was yeah. like, well, that's interesting. You wanted me to teach this clinic, but you don't know what ethnic I am. You know, and my yeah. I'm Garcia, so I'm definitely Latin. Yeah. You know, so Latino and I'm brown. Right. So, but it was really cool when I first, I was kind of like, I felt like I was going into the clinic not fully open minded. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, because more of me, I don't see people as color. I don't see race. I don't see, I see people as people. So I was struggling internally with 
what the difference is in this class. You know, how am I teaching this class? Yeah. So it was kind of, and I was intrigued because I like really wanted to show up for these people. Yes. You know, so I remember, I, you know, I, how to go? And what uh, a person who, you know, who identified as um, they and them. And that mm-hmm. was the first time I was really kind of like, oh, this is interesting. I didn't yeah. really understand that. Yes. Um, but we just had this amazing talk on the walk in, you know, it's like, oh, that's that connection. So to me, it's all about the connection with the person. And right. I think that's the most better aspect. And she was terrified. She was like on this mission to do things that scare her to death. It was <laughs> her, what we talked about fear based. And then like, I, I do a talk, I do actually a presentation about fear and I do, uh, I and mean, most of us do like grief and that kind of stuff, but the fear base of us as a society, a lot of times fear controls our emotions. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and I kind of talked to her about that and we went and climbed and I remember she was terrified to start climbing, but I literally climbed beside her and we just had this conversation. Not even focusing on the climb, we just talked. Sure. You know, and then there she was, she was on her way up and that kind of stuff. And we worked on the mechanics. Mm-hmm. You know, first is connecting with her as a person, connecting with what her fears were and understanding that it's okay to have that fear. But you don't have to let it hold you back because you're the one that's in charge of that. So then the climbing with there and understanding that you're in charge, you can go down if you want, you can go up if you want. Yeah, yeah. There's no one's stopping you. So that was pretty interesting. And then, you know, and then I started working with the other climbers and it was just pretty cool how everybody connect. It was more the connection. Yeah. Do you, you know, have you seen yeah. the have you seen the real rock uh fifteen yet? They have a segment in there called uh black ice and there are there's a climbing gym that's in memphis that's a nonprofit that started up i'm sure they're struggling because what nonprofit isn't struggling um valdez adventure alliance is a nonprofit, and we have vast responsibilities but um but we're you know um but valdez you know i mean between worthington glacier and the blueberry lake campgrounds and the cabins at shoot bay marine state park i mean and then the two different festivals, it's uh, Ice Climbing Festival and the Fat Bike Festival. It's, uh, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot. And so, um, but what was great was a group of black climbers from Memphis were invited to go up to Bozeman and climb. And, um, you know, it, it's been something that I've been processing as well because I, I'm a person of color. Uh, my mother is from Japan. And I grew up with all kinds of things. I grew up with, you know, Pocahontas. I'm Chinese because isn't that the same as Japanese? If I'm not, if I'm if I'm sort of brown in the summertime, I must be Mexican, you know. <laughs> you know. So I mean, it's all kinds. Of, and so, like, really, I was kind of lucky growing up um, because I had um, my mom's friends that were also all Japanese ladies. Um, so I had some sort of a sense of identity or ethnicity or community, but, um, you know, for a majority, 98% easy of my life, um, I've been like the only one, you know, when I was in third grade, um, there was a Cambodian refugee that came to our school. And so our teacher thought, oh, well, that's kind of Asian and she's Asian. So we'll just put them together because they must speak the same language. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because he didn't oh, speak, yes. he, <laughs> you know, so there are all kinds of these strange misunderstandings. And to be honest with you, you know, I saw that group and how they felt comfortable with each other. But I don't even know what I would do with myself if there was like an all Japanese gym that like sprouted up in Austin, you know, where, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what I would do with so many Japanese people. I have no idea. Yeah. And then when I went to Japan, that was probably the first time I realized I'm American. I am just, I have distinctly American, uh, habits, you know, and idiosyncrasies. Um, and I was like a foot taller than everybody. So, (laughs) you know, but, um, but that sense of community that the, the folks, the climbers in, in the segment black ice had with each other was so special and it really, you know, is remarkable. Um, their ambition, you know, where, where they're come from, where they come from, where they want to go, you know, and we all do have that. 
Um, and so when, uh, so Valley's Adventure Alliance also now has uh, started a um, Connect Scholarship Fund. And um, that program is specifically to help, uh, you know, indigenous, there's a large indigenous population that's in the north, in Alaska, through Canada, you know, the Arctic Circle. Um, yeah. The indigenous population may or may not have their own troubles and, you know, personal issues that they have to deal with. Um, but then also the scholarship fund, the Connect Scholarship Fund, is to help provide accessibility to women, people who identify as women, LGBTQIA plus community, and the BIPOC community. So if anybody does want to like go to the Valdez Ice Climbing Festival, for example, or the Valdez Bad Bike Bash, that we can help make it more accessible for them to get there one way or another. You know, it may not be a lot, but but we can do what we can. We can do our part in trying to make the world more accessible, more more open, you know. So, yeah. So that's interest. That was an interesting. It sounds like that was the first experience that you had with some of the uh, the labels and the terminology. And yeah, it was <laughs> in, ironically, one of the guys in, in that film, Black Ice, was he came in to shadow me. Oh, um, wonderful. John Blake, but it was it started with the name. His name started with the name. It's John Blake, it was his name, but he's a young ice climber from the Bozeman area. Okay. And um, and he, I remember him coming up to me, hey, Marcus, I'm just new to this, you know, the whole teaching clinic so bad. Do you mind if I just shadow you and, and understand how wonderful. you teach climbing? And that was like, oh, this is really cool. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, and so for me, walking away from that clinic opened up my mind to like, yeah, there is a difference and there is uh, a different connection and community. Yes. And that kind of stuff. And it's like, I, it was interesting because I grew up, you know, Latin and never really a kind of experience because I grew up in a town where we had a lot of Vietnamese and then they're like, a lot of Vietnamese, whites, and then couple of Latins, hey, Latinos, and I think there were like five of us in old school, <laughs> and then like two black guys, you know, so it was kind of interesting, but I was friends with everybody, Yeah, so I didn't really, I didn't see It's them. not natural, it's not natural it was, to be a prejudiced yeah. person, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's, these are, it's, it's taught, you know, and yeah. so like, if, if we can learn it, we can unlearn it, if it was schooled yeah. to us, we, it can be unschooled, you know? Yeah. I didn't really experience a lot of it. I mean, I kind of grew up with a little bit of prejudice off and on, but then when I actually moved here to Durango, now we have a lot of, we have a Navajo nation. Oh, wow. And, and I remember my first time I moved here, I was looking for some work, so I started working for this guy. And mm -hmm. There was a group of Navajos, and, you know, here's the white guy, and here's me, the Mexican guy, you know, Latin guy. <laughs> and then the, the, um, I remember the guys, they were not wanting to listen to him. And he's like, we well, used to speak their language. You're like, no, actually, I don't speak their language. It's kind of like what you were talking about. Like, no, I'm Hispanic. Right, <laughs> right. Navajo. Just because we're brown doesn't mean we're the same. The first time I went to a Navajo mall, um, yeah. they're on the reservation. I think we were in Arizona. And my friend had this big, blonde, Afro-type hairdo. <laughs> and the this... Uh, older dad looking dude really stoic let's just at this you know at the front counter cowboy hat on turquoise you know like what are those things called Bolero, boleros or bolo or whatever yeah would not speak to me spoke to me only in navajo and then his daughter was like down the aisle a little bit and came up and rolled her eyes pushed him aside he knows how to speak english he's just not going to speak english to you because of your friend <laughs> Yeah, that's so interesting. So yeah. still here, and it's just crazy how here we are, you know, still prejudice is, is, is rampant in our country. Yes, and yeah. So well, there's been, it's been a long journey for a lot of people to find equitable opportunities. So, um, yeah, and, and hopefully, hopefully there will be lessons learned. 
and it won't just be, you know, like your, your friend that was, that you were, or your student that was they, um, they could have been angry that you, you know, didn't, hadn't heard that before, but instead they used it as a teachable moment for you. And I mean, that's really, that's the, that's the crux right there. That's the chain game changer, you know? Oh, it's huge game changer. And and yeah, I think, and now more more of these clinics are kind of popping up and it's, it's really cool that you see the diversity of people in these clinics, you know, I was just a lander, I was teaching a, a movement class, but next to me was a class about um, humanity and how we how we communicate with people struggling. And I was like, oh, that's really cool because I like I like that side. I like the mental aspect of climbing and what it brings and how we connect and, and talk. And like, it was interesting while I was teaching my movement class, I had a husband and wife group, and um, she was very. Like I was teaching her like I normally teach, mm-hmm. but she wasn't getting what I was saying. And I said, Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, no, I don't understand you. I need you to be direct with me. Like, oh, okay, that's all I needed to hear. It's like, how do you need me to teach for you? And it's interesting that yeah. her husband's like, Wow, I never knew that about her. Wow, this is cool. And, you know, so I'm like, hey, I want you to do this for me. Yeah, and when I said that and then communicated with her directly like that, it kind of one made her feel more comfortable with me. Yeah, she took um, criticism better because I was kind of criticizing how she was moving, mm-hmm. but she got very like defensive with it. And I yeah, sense this, she wasn't open to hearing me because she didn't feel like I was actually talking to her. Gotcha. So gotcha. Like, oh, this is how this is. I think what you needed to you know. It's all about how she is their words and communicate with them and her husband was like oh this is awesome thank you so much <laughs> he got like more out of it than that's, like, that's what wonderful that's what it's about you know like, yes you're, you're always learning even though I'm the one teaching I'm still learning it's like the love languages right you know you have to speak somebody's love you have to find out what their love language is you know yeah, yeah. the love language of climbing you know the love language of teaching climbing <laughs> Yeah, I think that should be part of the application of that clinic. What is your love language? <laughs> what is your love language? That's, it. That's what we do at Valdez. Maybe, maybe I'll put that on the application. Yeah, you how do you teach with your love language? That's excellent. <laughs> well, Marcus, thank you so much for um, speaking with me today. I really appreciate oh, yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again for listening to Low Tech Tuesdays by Low Tech and Wild. This podcast supports Valdez Adventure Alliance up in Valdez, Alaska, where they strongly believe in nature therapy. Their goal is to bring this to those who will appreciate it. One might say those who need it. Their focus is teaching through play. They are strong encouragers. The events and resources that they provide will help people find the satisfaction of self-accomplishment through effort of climbing, of riding bikes, of hiking, of trail building, of immersing in nature. They encourage people to allow themselves to surrender to the flow of the vast beauty of those mountains and the Prince William Sound. Their objective is to be a resource for people to find deep happiness and healthy outlets for themselves in these ever-trying times. We would like to shout out to some of the Valdez Adventure sponsors, including IMBA, International Mountain Biking Association, Access Fund, Protecting America's Climbing, and the American Alpine Club. Some local sponsors include the City of Valdez, the CVEA Community Foundation, Alyeska Pipeline, the Fat Mermaid, the Prospector, Valdez Avalanche Center, Raven, Alaska. We'd also like to give a big shout out to Loa Boots, Tiger Tail, Hyperlight, the National Scenic Byway Foundation, Mountain Equipment, RAB, and Nick Wax. Thanks again for listening and enjoy your day.